so our, our speaker for today. Um, and um, our speaker for today is, is Dr. Paul Jepson, uh, who's a professor of environmental and molecular toxicology um, with Oregon State University in the United States. And um, Paul is a, 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 an internationally rec ec uh, recognized expert on ecotoxicology and um, uh, the use of pesticides in agroecosystems. Um, I, I first met Paul a long time ago uh, in West Africa, actually, when I was doing my PhD research, and Paul was uh, involved in a program with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations to measure the effects of pesticide use on um, aquatic water quality in, in streams and, and rivers. And since then, I've known of Paul's work over the years. And now that we've had an international issue with fall armyworm, Paul has emerged as one of the experts working on this topic. So uh, we'll very much look forward to his, his discussion today. Um, but before... Give a few introductions from Dr. Hossein. You may need to unmute your microphone, Dr. Hossein. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, it is my pleasure to join. And uh, such kind of important uh, uh, meeting uh, globally, especially Professor uh, Joseph uh, from Oregon State University, USA. And um, <clears throat> those who are joining with this uh, Zoom meeting. Actually, in Bangladesh, uh, corn is a very important crop for now. In contest, uh, as a uh, uh, crop yield, its usage, all consideration things, government, present government is very interested to expand corn all over the Bangladesh. Also, Bangladesh climate, soil, farmers' perception is very positive on corn production. In this context, as follow me on, um, uh, comes uh, as a threat productions, uh, though it's a few years in the uh, last uh, few years, 2018, in some part of Bangladesh, especially south, not west part, but Bangladesh uh, government, as well as Ministry of Agriculture and concern sections, especially CIMIT, FAO, USAID, and Bangladesh Agriculture Research Council make a tax force, timely formed the tax force um, that coordinate to protect this fuller muon spreading all over our country. In this <laughs> connection, government formed a tax force committee. Committee, it's a 16th members um, uh, containing that two professors from different universities, director, general department of agriculture extension, CIMI, TFAO, uh, of course, uh, BWMRI acting as a member secretary, and uh, Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, uh, Entomology Division Head, Bangladesh Rice Research Institute, uh, that Entomology Department Head, containing 14 members. We are acting on uh, fall army on controlling. Every month uh, we are sitting together and we are uh, deciding how to uh, protect or what we will be do uh, for controlling these things. But many different research sectors also 
some research activities continue in my research station as well as in farmers field some research uh, continue and also we are spreading out in chemical control as well as in um, uh, protection through biological means tax force committee set up some trials in the farmers field as well as in research fields uh, looking what is the good options uh, for controlling uh, that uh, fallen mirror <clears throat> last few months as our observations we already um, identified two chemicals uh, with help of cement uh, um, that uh, works we do that's uh, two product uh, that's one of the citrating element it's called um, uh, fortinza um, yeah. and yes fortinza another another is a uh, faulisens that's uh, need yeah. spread in uh, some later stages it's yeah. uh, works good and also we are uh, set up some experiment uh, with uh, intercropping with some legume crops um, with maize and legume crops <clears throat> also it looks um, promising though it is very um, first year experiment we continuing uh, in our research fund but the uh, impact uh, looks uh, positive with control plot and that uh, set up plot there is some variations it uh, looks uh, impressive to me as well as the uh, researcher those are working on uh, that controlling so phalaremium uh, we need to do much more on it as bangladesh uh, is still uh, we are in learning stage uh, though some experts on um, entomological expert uh, with us <coughs> means working with nursing um, uh, media team especially dr uh, sunil alam he is one of the best uh, entomology scientist in bangladesh uh, he is uh, working uh, with us so also there are many monitoring and observation apps already um, developed uh, by simit Uh, we are uh, establishing in uh, farmers field through department of agriculture extensions we are also uh, conducting some advanced training uh, with the extension personnel uh, researchers that is also continuing it looks a uh, good impact uh, because it is a, a new pest and also uh, farmers are still not much aware uh, how to control so yeah. we need to expand <coughs> technique uh, how to um, monitor control observation uh, those things are are continue and uh, from government sides government is very very positive to expand corn in bangladesh because uh, as we need more mass more amount of corn presently we are for the we seeing 5.4 million tons annually but our requirement about 7 million tons but the increasing rate is positive uh, we are expecting next 2 3 years we are able to self sufficient in corn productions so we need to protect that threat fallen me on as well as other uh, disease uh, um on uh, corn productions uh, so i think today's um, expecting your uh, is piece uh, that will be an uh, in this our knowledge um, because you are you are the top positions and you are the very very expert as i know your profiles so i think from your is piece uh, um, we are able to learn um, about an uh, Follow me on. Uh, that will be help our national policy planning, as well as the uh, tips to the farmers. Uh, we will able to control um, follow me on. Right. So I again welcome all of you um, <coughs> from uh, on behalf of Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Research uh, Institute.
it is located not than part of bangladesh uh, it's called dinaspur so i must uh, thanks uh, dr team and his uh, team members arranging uh, such kind of important uh, meeting so uh, from my side uh, again i thank you so next time i will be at some things later on okay of our team. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hossein. I, I just want to recognize that we're very lucky to have uh, among colleagues from CIMIT and from BWMRI, we have colleagues from the Bangladesh Rice Research Institute and also from the Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, as well as colleagues directly from the Department of Agricultural Extension and I may also be missing additional uh, colleagues from different organizations who are here as well. My apologies for that. Uh, but welcome everybody. And without waiting further, let's hear from Dr. Jepson uh, about his presentation and we'll have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tim, and thank you, Director, for uh, such a nice introduction. And uh, good morning, everybody, or should I say good evening from Oregon, because it's uh, 9.30 at night here nearly now. Um, and it's really great to be able to talk with you today, and I'm sorry I'm not there in person. One of the advantages of using this is that probably more of you are able to kind of uh, participate than might otherwise be the case if I was to visit, for example. So there's some advantages to these remote connections, but I would love to visit with you all someday as well. Um, so I'm Paul Jepson. Can you see my screen here, Tim? Could you? Can, OK, um, <clears throat> I've got several co-authors. One is Katie Murray, who's a long term colleague of mine from Oregon State University. And um, has, she is an anthropologist and she led our work in Malawi and Kenya, which I'll be talking about. Uh, Mikta Keola is from uh, Catholic Relief Services in Malawi and was a facilitator and a real major expert involved in our work in, in Malawi. And Makfu Sa is a long term colleague who I've worked with since I think 2006 at FAO in Senegal. So today this reflects our kind of collective wisdom, but also the work of many people. And at the moment I'm co-chairing the technical working group in the FAO that's addressing pesticides and fall armyworm. I'm part of the task force addressing the locust problem, which has surged again in Africa. And I'm working in a number of uh, Asian crops, uh, including oil palm, black pepper and celery seed at the moment. So there's a variety of projects happening remotely. And I'm looking forward to uh, continuing with those. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Africa, and I'm not meaning to reflect I, not deep knowledge of what may be occurring in Bangladesh. And so um, our experiences there are relevant, but it is a different context. And uh, so um, it will be interesting to hear some of the contrasts. But there's widespread availability in Africa of extremely toxic broad spectrum pesticides that are actually no longer sold in many parts of the world, including the United States. And here we see a bottle of uh, monocrotophos, uh, methamidophos, and profenophos, none of which are registered here, and all of which are available in eastern and southern Africa and in use against fall armyworm. So there's a high level of evidence from direct observation and many reports of widespread use of insecticides. And I'll be talking about why these particular products are chosen late, later on. Um, because the, the availability and use is dominated by very toxic materials and cost is certainly a factor. So I will get into that in a while. Um, in, with some of these materials, the highest level of personal protection, like spray suits, are, are simply inappropriate. So one reason one of these compounds was eliminated from the United States market is even a double layer of PPE protected clothing was insufficient to protect applicators. And so um, that's something which uh, is you know, surprising. These materials are still in the marketplace, but it means there's pressure on us as scientists and extension workers and educators to consider uh, risks beyond the risk to the crop. Um, PPE as well, the, you know, masks and gloves and protective clothing isn't widely available and used. 
And so some impacts are inevitable, then they're avoidable as well. And so that's something that is a sub theme of my presentation is where can we progress? How can we progress in the African context to less toxic, but also efficient and affordable pesticides? And that is the slow path that we're gradually following and moving along. Um, and so one thing I'll show now and at the end is just this general model from left to right. Uh, the, there's, a, there's a timeline here uh, that um, may be years long, but we start on the left here, if you can see my pointer, with a thing called phase out for highly hazardous pesticides, HHPs. And I'll talk briefly about those in a, in a, in a little while. But these are the materials that really are too toxic for a smallholder farmer to use and maybe too toxic even for a, um, <clears throat> a larger scale, well-trained and supported farmer. And then in terms of IPM development, the honorable director mentioned a few minutes ago, biological control and use of very selective, very specific pesticides. And this is very much a goal of IPM, integrated pest management. <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, to have different methods being compatible with each other. And certain of the compounds that are in widespread use at the moment are simply not compatible with IPM. And so if we can consider ways of phasing out use of those materials, we gradually build the potential for IPM to be implemented. One follows the other um, because uh, uh, some of the materials we're talking about act as a barrier to IPM adoption. And so if we're aiming for what we call a resilient and biologically rational IPM that makes use of natural enemies, but doesn't shy away from pesticides if they're needed, we have to somehow define what that combination of practices and materials will be. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not coming up with a prescription, not suggesting what you should be doing. I'm just sharing experiences we have from other parts of the world, parts of the world and offering our expertise in uh, supporting your efforts, which I'd be very honored to provide. Um, so let me just talk briefly about two studies we have uh, conducted um, in, um, and I'm, Tim, I'm going to talk until like um, 9.50 my time, another 20 minutes or so. Is that too long or is that about right? I think that's about fine, yes. So, so give me a warning if I'm talking too long or too inappropriately or, you know, we'll uh, need to speed up. Thank you. <clears throat> so in Malawi, um, Katie Murray, who's one of the, the lead author of this chapter, and by the way, I sent Tim a PDF version of our presentation. Tim, you're very welcome to share that with everybody. And there's hyperlinks in there that connect you to all the publications I'm talking about. So you can see those and print them if you wish. And all of our scientific publications are published in what's called an open source format. They're freely available to you um, if you can have access to the internet. So in Malawi, we consulted farmers and extension agents. Um, their requests were that uh, low risk pesticides would be evaluated and registered. And it sounds like you're doing just that thing in, in Bangladesh. Um, improve, commun improve communication about IPM because it, it's a very textbooky thing, IPM. There's a lot of detail, there's lots of knowledge required, but there's also a huge amount of common sense and practicality. So talking about IPM more, strengthening research and extension, it's wonderful to hear you have a specialized institute now. Um, monitoring progress. I mean, how many farmers are adopting practices that are considered uh, leading at the moment? Um, do you measure this? You know, understanding where you are is quite important. Uh, building upon local knowledge and risk management education, something we've done quite a lot with my colleagues in USAID and with colleagues in nonprofit organizations and the CG institutes is simply talking about the risks as well as the benefit and balancing those and giving farmers the information they need to make decisions. We also did this work in, in Kenya. and This is also published in a report on the CIMIT uh, website and we really appreciate uh, CIMIT's um, uh, support here. And um, so in Kenya, uh, farmers lacked access 
even in the highest yielding areas, they lacked basic information on the biology of the pest. We assume that people know things that we simply sometimes haven't taken the trouble to go and communicate about. And this pest has a rather unique and troubling biology as a pest organism. There was lack of capacity amongst extension and spray service providers uh, for simply working out when to spray, making that decision and working out how to spray. And agricultural dealers did not have access to the protective clothing that was actually required according to the label of the pesticide. And that's a situation that's untenable. And so you're welcome to read those reports and look at the methods we used, but we heard similar requests from throughout the countries that we visited. So one thing I like doing is walking up to a pesticide kiosk and saying, what would you recommend if there was fall armyworm in my maize crop? And we get the dealers to put these little bottles on their shelf and say, these are the things that we recommend. So in Malawi, for example, here are some classical, typical uh, bottles. And um, two of these materials, profenophos, an organophosphate pesticide, and deltamethrin, this one over here, a synthetic pyrethroid, are simply not compatible with natural enemies, never mind their other risks. So if you're looking to uh, have natural enemies present in your crop and doing their work, then using these products prevents that. And I've published several hundred papers, but the, um, many of them have been about the long-term impacts of pesticides on natural enemy populations, which can take months to recover after exposure to these types of material. So some of the materials that are in widespread availability and use are not compatible with natural enemies. They're also not compatible with these, the farmers. <clears throat> because uh, PPE, protective clothing, is not in use. Gloves are in short supply and not really affordable. And if you know anything about the requirements of pesticide-proof gloves, you'll know that you're meant to change them like every five or six sprays that you do. And so um, simply having protective clothing available does not seem to be a viable option in Malawi. And so materials that are not compatible with human health requirements are not compatible with IPM either. Um, now, a lot of my work on natural enemies gets really down into detail. I even spent some time looking at the footprints of natural enemies and pests. So here we see the footprints of a Spadoptera larva, and they make an extraordinary pattern on this uh, sooty surface, as you'll see. And I studied the way in which pesticides are picked up onto the bodies of insects and tried to understand how a natural enemy might be exposed to a pesticide. In this photograph on the right, with beetles receiving direct droplets of spray using a fluorescent tracer in the spray tank. And in this case, looking at residues being picked up from a leaf. Now with fall armyworm, when they're stuck inside the maize well, there's almost like a stem borer hidden away under a blanket of frash, frash their excretory material, they're actually less exposed to pesticides than most natural enemies are. And that's a situation that, that causes alarm for IPM specialists because you can eliminate natural enemies and still have very little impact on the pest through applying your pesticides. So that's another reason why we're concerned in this case. But exposure doesn't finish at the insects. Farmers and farm workers and those that re-enter the field are also exposed. So we put little silicone wristbands like my watch strap onto farmers in Senegal, and we measured the amount of pesticide that they received in their wristband. And here we have a distribution of doses that were on their wrist uh, that they're exposed to. And all of these different colored lines show the different pesticides. One of these I might show you, this dotted line is chlorpyrifos, a widely available but extremely hazardous and toxic organophosphate pesticide. And that was found in 50% of the farmers and farm family members that we tested. Again, you can find this paper later by simply clicking on that link. And it's a short article in a Royal Society journal, but there's no doubt natural enemies and people are exposed. And it's, it's the fall armyworm we're trying to expose, not those other groups. And so care and attention in terms of relative exposure and impacts is clearly very important. We know this. 
So in Africa, there's at least 57. We've now documented more than 60 pesticides recommended in, against fall armyworm. 13 of these are what are called highly hazardous. And these are materials that are slated, listed for phase out and elimination globally. And there's international agreements about this because they are too toxic for use by anyone, never mind, for example, a smallholder farmer who may have limited access to education, limited access to the great research that you do, and uh, limited opportunities to buy or afford protective clothing or select pesticides effectively. 32 more of these materials had either high environmental and or human health risks, but these are risks that could be mitigated if only you knew what those risks were and how to manage them. And the article that I'm referring to goes into some detail about this, and I won't talk about that a lot today, but you click on this link and you can get a free copy of that work. And then 11 materials are lower risk, but some of them just don't work very well. But really fantastically for fall armor, about eight of those materials are potentially highly efficacious and lower risk. Now you could ask why some of the high risk materials are not effective against fall armyworm and it's because it's been sprayed for decades in the West here and the Caribbean and in South America and so unfortunately Africa and now Asia has acquired partially or fully resistant populations to many of the older classes of pesticide. So if even if the risks were not enough to consider, the history of treatment is very, very important to consider. <clears throat> We've published our work in, in highly esteemed journals, A, to test whether or not the science is any good, but B, to, to show that this work meets the highest standards of quality and rigor. Because what used to happen at an earlier stage in my career was uh, people in the pesticide world would say, oh, he's just a young guy in England where I was at the time, and you shouldn't really pay much attention to what he's doing. So one thing we've tried to do is publish our work in the top journals in the world. I'm not boasting about this, but fall armyworm is an incredibly important pest. And the work we've done in West Africa and East Africa on other pests and fall armyworm um, has arrived in these journals and you're welcome again to look at those papers and they report this issue of widespread availability and use of very broad spectrum, very old materials that are no longer sold in, in America, for example. Um, we conducted a lot of uh, kind of modeling work and analysis of pesticide risks and we've been doing this and reporting it to farmers in extension programs since 2009. So we've had a lot of practice in talking about risks and benefits together. Um, and uh, well, I've never had any pushback or comment from farmers about discussing pesticide risk, because if you ask a farmer to share their own experience, they often have a story to tell of their personal experience of something they wish had not happened. And this work was taken up by an organization called the Rainforest Alliance and is now used in certified crops um, in more than 60 countries now and in more than a million farm households. And since 2018, we've been using the study I'm going to share with you in a few minutes in um, Africa and now Asia. I'm very modest about sharing this work with you, um, but um, it does a lot of people have contributed to what I'm sharing with you and combined with your wisdom and experience and already the things I'm hearing from your honorable director and um, the great Tim Krupnik, um, you know, clearly there's a coincidence here of goodwill, good science and planning that can assist your farmers to maintain high yields, but not put themselves at risk. So I'm going to go into more detail on this. And I'm sorry, it's a, it's a lot of small words on a very large slide. But what, we, what I've done here is to show the, the, the first line is materials that are low risk to human health and the environment. And I'll talk about those a bit more in a minute. The second row is chemicals that have very high environmental risk. The third row is materials that have high health and environmental risks. And the fourth line are the so-called highly hazardous pesticides that simply we should agree, and there are 
The FAO, CIMIT, other organizations are very much behind this. We seek not to have these in use in the marketplace. And again, you can find out more if you read our papers or I'm very glad to answer your questions. But if we go right the way up to the top here, this is unusual. With fall armyworm, there's a suite of materials that are low risk and efficacious. And the director spoke a few minutes ago about a, a nuclear polyhydrosis virus, which is uh, one of these materials, Essa uh, Spodoptera frugiperda MPV. And he also talked about uh, Fortenza, which is this chemical cyantraniliprol, which is a synthetic pesticide. Uh, farmers in Oregon use this where I live, and it's very good. And of course, one thing would, would be a goal, an appropriate goal in Bangladesh is, well, we need five or six materials that we can rotate between so we don't push the insects towards resistance. And so if you look at this range of materials that are of interest kind of internationally, We've got as a director indica or neem, which actually um, the seed extract is rather effective against um, fall armyworm, particularly the younger stages. And the commercial products tend to be better than home extracted materials. Then one of the BT subspecies, Azawai, seems to have good efficacy, particularly again against, against small, again, against small larvae. Then there are these materials, chlorantraniliprol and cyantraniliprol, flubendiamide. Yes, I'm trying to pronounce them, and nimethoxyphenazide. And they all seem to have some efficacy throughout the United States and in places they've been tried in Africa and where they're registered also. Then uh, pyrethrum, uh, uh, an extract of a uh, chrysanthemum flower and used by organic farmers seems to have some efficacy. And we can talk more about that. I don't rate it really highly, but it's considered to be okay. And then this nuclear polyhydrosis virus is promising. But if you follow this link after the presentation, and if you ever want to hear anything more from me, you can read some of, some of this work. Um, you'll find uh, 650 pesticides all rated in terms of their risk to human health and different environmental risks. And I just wanted to let you know, as, as entomology colleagues, some of you, that we're just about to publish a website that will have the natural enemy toxicity of all these materials on it, on it as well. But one of the great things to understand about fall armyworm management is that some of the newer and older, more traditional, lower risk pesticides can be very effective when used against this insect. So why is Profenophos, for example, used when we know it's not very effective? Um, firstly, it's low cost. The farmers can, can afford it and they're pretty desperate. Fall armyworm, certainly where I've seen it in Southern and East Africa, makes a real mess of the crop. And it's a very distressing and of deep concern to farmers when they see this. It's available, so the market pathways exist. There are claims for efficacy, which I'll talk again about in a minute. And the one reason it was banned in the United States and is no longer registered is it's one of the most persistent organophosphate materials that's ever been synthesized. In fact, in cotton crops, 60 days after an application of profenophos, if a farm worker walks into a cotton field, that's two months after treatment, they'd still receive a dermal or skin exposure that exceeds the EPA's recommended daily maximum dose. So this is a very persistent, very toxic material. One thing farmers are doing is they're walking along the row with their backpack sprayer and squirting a little pesticide, a little bit of pesticide into each whirl. And the surfactant in the pesticide and the water in the pesticide alone are sufficient to be toxic and lethal to the insect because there's very little activity from Profenophos actually on the insect itself. And so there's many reasons why materials that have been available and are present in the marketplace are just simply unsuitable for health reasons, but also not very effective in an IPM context, but they're still used. And this always seems to be a surprise, but I have to tell you this kind of thing happens in America also that compounds that are rated as inefficient are often used by farmers because they say, look, I've always used that, I can afford it, I don't think this pest is very easy to control, so that's what I'm doing. So again, 
Um, there has to be a positive message that's based on good research evidence to convince someone to make a change in their choice when they think they're taking a risk by moving away from the things that they normally use. And so a lot of care and attention really needs to go into that communication side. Now for Malawi, and I don't know what costs are like in Bangladesh, so I've done a US dollars um, conversion here. Um, a chemical like flubendiamide, for example, can cost $23 um, a hectare to spray. And I don't know about farmers in Bangladesh, but farmers in Africa are just very resistant to spending that amount of money and they probably would not be able to afford it. Emamectin benzoate appears to be quite a good product against fall armyworm, although it has some human toxicity and protective clothing is needed, but that's $32 a hectare. Whereas, for example, delta methrin, which I talked about earlier, uh, is only three. So there's no easy answer here. Cost is definitely a factor. We're spending quite a lot of effort in our latest guide we're producing in USAID to respect the fact that farmers have cost limits. So spraying parts of the fields, sharing a sprayer between different fields and different farms, getting in early, uh, making good product choices and only treating the areas that seem to be affected, recognizing early damage so you get maximum efficacy. All of these things seem to be important. And we're arguing that you can stretch your budget with more expensive pesticides if, you just, if it's appropriate to use them, you have a chance of regaining of, of gaining some yield benefit that's going to pay off. But secondly, that you don't need to spray the whole field. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this now, but I've spent a lot of my career, um, as well as doing uh, research and publishing in journals, I walk out into the field and in Africa and in America and elsewhere, I used to work in Europe and talk to farmers about how they use sprayers and how to apply a pesticide directly. I have to say, I have to relearn some of this every time I do it. And it's actually rather difficult to calibrate a pesticide sprayer and to use it effectively and apply the right dose and the right amount of spray. So um, this isn't an easy task. And one thing we're about to publish is an application practices manual that includes the kind of cartoons of good application practices uh, for calibrating and using a sprayer. We've done a lot of exercises in Africa and just the simple one of an older spray uh, applicator like me, for example, is gonna walk around a field more slowly than a 16 year old who's been given a, you know, a, a, a little bit of money to go and treat the field as would commonly happen in some of the countries I visit. And if you walk around more quickly, um, you're going to need more, a more concentrated pesticide in the spray tank than if you walk around more slowly uh, because for a, a, a sprayer that, that emits the same amount, the same volume of um, pesticide. And so simple calculations of calibration commonly do not take into account this difficulty of spraying the crop, how developed it is, and who's doing the spraying. And so uh, when you talk about this with farmers, it's very, very easy and common to find out people are treating with more than five times the recommended application rate. And even compounds that are mildly toxic to beneficial insects are really toxic to beneficial insects when they're treated at much higher application rates than the manufacturer intends. And I, will, I cannot overemphasize the need simply to get out there and show people a share with them good tips for spray application. And by the way, that means you practicing a few nights before with a spray tank with water in it to check that you know what you're doing and you're getting it right. And so again, uh, it's not beneath any of us to get out there and talk about the most practical things. Uh, so again, I'm finishing now. Uh, hopefully you won't be pleased to hear, <laughs> but... Um, I just spoke briefly about the phase out or, or not emphasizing use of highly hazardous and high risk materials, because in eliminating the use of those, we gradually enable a system to be more accessible to IPM, particularly the role that natural enemies can play. And we also provide a basis for protecting farmers and their families and preventing them being exposed to risks and consumers also 
that are easily avoidable with a limited amount of very high quality education on just the basics of IPM. But most of all, please note that all of these tables we've put together, all of the analyses that we've done um, are helpful for anybody working in IPM to uh, design a program that might include pesticides if they're affordable and there's a justification for their use and they're applied properly, um, selecting the right material and talking to the people that sell pesticides, all of these basic fundamental things that we unfortunately in many parts of the world we don't do, including here, um, it's just very important to, to do. But I feel very honored to have been asked to do this today. And um, it's well after dark here now, uh, but um, I'd be very glad to entertain any questions. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Paul, very much for the presentation. Um, we have a few questions that have come into the chat, but before answering those, I wondered if I could call upon Dr. Malam um, to say just a few words um, and perhaps other colleagues on the call could comment about what some of the most commonly used pesticides that we're seeing applied to fall armyworm are in Bangladesh. Um, and then after hearing a little bit about that, Paul, I think it might be useful if you could give a few thoughts about how you would advise um, that we start addressing um, issues of misuse in cases of misuse. Um, okay. This is also, I, I think, really important. We're very honored and lucky to have a colleague who's the director of the Plant Protection Wing at the Department of Agricultural Extension who has joined us. Welcome, sir. Um, and the Department of Plant Protection at, um, or the Plant Protection Wing at the Department of Agricultural Extension is responsible for um, approval processes on, on pesticides and um, also some issues around pesticide stewardship. So it would be good to hear a little bit about, about that. Dr. Allen, could you kindly comment? Yeah, thank you very much, team, and uh, also to Jack, Dr. Jack's professor Jackson's excellent presentations. So I am totally agree with uh, you. Uh, in Bangladesh, the same thing is happening, but probably we are somewhat ahead than Africa because you know you have seen that monocrotophos or that type of uh, the pesticide we have banned long before in Bangladesh. Yeah. So those things are not available in the market. So it's a good thing for us. Another thing is uh, if we come to the fall army of um, uh, this uh, management, uh, as you told, that's the, uh, the uh, price. Really, the price is a big issue also in Bangladesh because uh, we have seen the, in Bangladesh maximum of the farmers at first ut utilizing this lambda cyhalothrin or chloripyrifos types of pesticide for controlling fall armyworm. But you know that uh, there is a very much temperature effects uh, on the fall armyworm population. And in our Bangladesh, uh, we are actually generally doing it during October, November, one plantation, and generally March, April, another plantation. October, yeah. November plantation means uh, we are calling it winter plantation. So yeah. there is December, January is there and the temperature is going down. So yeah. during that time, when there is temperature more than 10 degree or something like uh, then the infestation is too much and the farmers cannot uh, actually control it with these types of lambda cyanotrine, chloripyrifos or synthetic pyrethrite. But yeah. they are utilizing because the dealers are also getting more profit from them uh, the pesticide dealers, those who are actually yeah. dealing the business, and they are interested to sell them to the farmers. Yeah. Number one thing is that, and farmers are also utilizing it as a low cost. But yeah. you are right that uh, for efficient control, we have seen that if we take combinations, we can actually go like with the seed treating agent first, which can actually uh, uh, this uh, have a effect up to three to four weeks. Uh, these our body scientists and all the BWR MRI scientists, they already have, have seen and also showing yeah. it to the farmers. <clears throat> Secondly, whenever the population is going up, so we are going with a biological control. And we have a Fowley gen. We have, previously, we have SN, S, uh, Spodoptera nuclear polyhydrosis virus. But now we have a Spodoptera Fujipata nuclear polyhydrosis the virus Fowley gen, commercially available. So after then, in a this alternative way, we are actually suggesting the farmers, if the population is rise more and more after this, 
So especially during the summer time, uh, going for Corinthiani pole, especially we have several products of Corinthiani pole and uh, also the other pesticide. Lastly, like spinosad is also working excellently, we have seen, but spinosad is too costly uh, in our market. So farmers are actually reluctant to use uh, that uh, type of costly pesticide. But in that okay. way, if we can actually utilize, we have seen the farmers even in a very, very uh, uh, this infestation or very uh, big outbreak, they can also yeah. control. In many cases right. we have seen in that way. Even some of the farmers, they actually, they're not teaching the seeds, but they actually start uh, applying this polygen then in a uh, alternative combination with other things also working well. And yeah. another things, you know, the intercropping, it says we have also, also seen that some of the intercropping like uh, yeah. uh, this, the farmers are very much fond of with the intercropping in Bangladesh in many areas, like uh, uh, this uh, coriander, radis, and some of the pulse crop, like as our director general BW Marai told, that we have seen yeah. without any spray, because there are a lot of conservation of biological control agent. Yeah. So can actually, naturally it is. Yeah. Right. yeah. And you know- Coriander is great, yeah. Yeah, and just a, a final word is that uh, we, you actually rightly talk that IPM is only in talking and it's uh, in a test book in many places, in Bangladesh was also, but uh, now we are proceeding some because now the biocontrol agent is now commercially yeah. available to the uh, farmers, like the Bracon habitor, one of the larval parasitoid, and okay. some of the this uh, uh, egg parasitoid like trichogramma is uh, uh, is available to the uh, farmers. So although okay. it's not so much popular to the farmer yet, but uh, yeah. we all of, we are proper, trying to popularize because yeah. uh, the commercial companies came forward. So that's yeah. a good thing for us. No, that, so that's is, really great. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's from my side. Yeah. Thank you very much for ex again yeah. for your excellent presentation. Thank you. I just had a couple of comments. So that's really great. So no, they're really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, so the the chemical that's in Fortenza, cyanotranilprol, and the other chemical you referred to, chlorantranilprol, are both uh, the it's same collagen. type of pesticide. Yeah. They're diamides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and diamonds, so, yes. Yeah, and so um, one thing I we're wondering is um, if, if say, someone's used the seed treatment of the cyanotrin of the prole, that perhaps you wouldn't recommend a diamide in the same season, for example, so that we, we avoid resistance onset. That's just one thought. Um, it is known that lambda cyhalothin, just to move on to that, um, has some efficacy with some populations in Africa but it's extremely toxic to natural enemies. So if there are parasitoids, like you've just mentioned, uh, Brecon and Trichogramma, um, you know, you'd really only save that for use in an outbreak situation or as an emergency rescue treatment, but it really doesn't have the efficacy of some of the other materials I, lift, I listed. Um, chlorpyrifos, there's been such a long history of spraying. Chlorpyrifos hasn't really worked against the genotypes we've seen in Africa for like 20 years. And so, um, you know, uh, because farmers will go out and do treatments and then not necessarily always go and measure the efficacy of those treatments, or they treat late stage larvae and the damage doesn't seem to increase afterwards because the larvae were going to pupate anyway. Um, you know, there's uh, really discouraging use of organophosphates is rather important. But lambda cyhalothrin gets less and less effective the warmer it gets. It's really most effective when it's rather cool. And so your observations really match our understanding of its chemistry. And, and just finally, I, everything you said was very interesting and really very uh, progressive. Um, don't forget BT and uh, neem because they actually, against younger larvae, are extremely effective. And so um, it's worth considering those products also. But thank you so much anyway. That sounds very good and just the going in the right direction. Thank you very much. And I actually forgot to tell you that is uh, both the products neem and also BT uh, 
already registered in our country. So yeah. we, this is also used and Neem product was registered, but at this moment, the re-registration is going to, especially for this Paul Army one. And okay. Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, uh, their yeah. head is uh, in connection with that. Probably he will also give a small comments on this. So Lovely. these products, we are actually uh, uh, bringing commercialized and actually for right. our farmers. Because as you know, that uh, this uh, pest is growing resistance to any of the pesticide, even to biopesticides yeah. also. Uh, so yeah. that's why we need a, a, a big list of uh, products so that if one uh, registered, yes. then with the, uh, we can switch to another one. Yes, thank yes, you. exactly. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. So I'd like, we have a limited time left, but I'd like to open the floor to others if there are direct questions that anyone would like to pose to Paul. And I'm going to take my computer to where there's a plug. So I'm talking to you while walking through my house. So excuse me, uh, but I'm very glad to answer a question while doing this. Uh, team, <laughs> um, not question, just as a few my request. Uh, as we are working as a Fall Army on Task Force Committee, we are always looking good product, uh, which are very effective against uh, Fall Army on. Yeah. So uh, just I raised this issue. Can we receive uh, some uh, materials uh, from USA for testing case in research institute? Is it can possible we receive as, as uh, <laughs> Professor uh, uh, Paul uh, Zepshan with us, uh, he can assist uh, us some materials? Well, well, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Um, uh, okay. actually, actually in you... Bangladesh, we are looking some products Yes. As you have a um, vast knowledge on uh, pesticides, so yes. can you uh, provide us some uh, materials, new materials through CIMIT? I can say through, through CIMIT, uh, yeah. for research uh, purpose, so we can right. um, uh, identify the um, very selective ones uh, against uh, yeah. pollen fever. Well, yeah. I think the, the, the mechanism that I would be able to follow would be that there may be materials that aren't currently registered, where mm -hmm. through the group I'm working with in FAO, if the manufacturers, for example, are aware that you've got a good research facility to evaluating a material and that it's part of the regulatory process in your country, then uh, that can speed up the um, access to experimental materials. Um, so, you know, if through, say, through Tim or directly to me, you said, well, we have an interest in, in these materials, I can certainly talk to USAID and Foreign Ag Service colleagues. I think um, what there's been a shortage of, uh, there's a perception, is people with, a, with significant expertise in evaluating materials in early crop growth, in middle stages of growth, and in the later stages of growth, where the uh, properties of the population, their distribution, and what the fall armyworm represents as a target vary as the crop grows. It's so having testing regimes going that evaluate efficacy at different stages of development has proven to be quite difficult. So if you have field facilities and, um, and experimental um, opportunities then that those can be taken up so i'll do whatever i can but i can't uh you know uh, myself uh, provide <laughs> uh, chemicals but i do i take a great interest in supporting the process of good evaluation so yeah i'm very glad to work with you and tim to identify things that might not have been tried or tested it sounds like you've got a pretty advanced marketplace actually from what i've been hearing from your colleagues so one thing, one one thing, what actually DGB Domra is telling that uh, like this Paulygen, it's also a US product, and we actually we get it uh, the help of USAID and also the CIMIT. So and we uh, make it a fast track registration with our task force, and also this uh, Centeni poll like this one also within four months we became available to the farmers. So That's if you uh, have yeah, if you have some just a link of uh, this type of good pesticide, which is actually yes. uh, this uh, very less yeah. uh, toxic and all these things. So we need that links. 
So that yeah. would be great for us, uh, for us yeah. because we have a very good uh, research people and uh, they can yeah. actually do all these things. Yeah. Well, one yeah. thing I might request is that you could talk with your colleagues and see uh, which of you has the most experience or um, would like to contribute to the process we've got running through the FAO in the technical working groups. And so uh, one of you that is on your Fall Army Worm Task Force, for example, might like to join one of the uh, FAO working groups. And um, then you'll meet colleagues who are from industry as well as research institutes around the world. And so, I mean, uh, that, that's another possibility that Tim might um, and you might consider um, who it is uh, could has information and results of research to share, but could also benefit by hearing first about what's being done in other places with interesting materials. I'm not trying to advocate for pesticide use in doing any of this, by the way, uh, but if they're going to be used, we want the right compounds to be selected and for them to be compatible with IPM. And so my emphasis is always viewing pesticides within a pest management context. And one of my concerns in the, some of the African countries I've gone to is that really the basic information is not really getting to the farmer who's the ultimate consumer for the chemicals and user of them uh, to, to manage their crop in such a way to minimize fall armyworm risks. So I just wanted to add, uh, Tim and colleagues, that I think it's very important always to think about the broader IPM picture and not just the, uh, the chemicals themselves. And that, that I absolutely agree with. Um, we do have a range of, of questions and, and in the, the chat. We're also uh, just a little bit over time, but Paul, as we started a little bit late, would you be willing to stay on for- Yeah, of course. A few minutes and take yeah. Yeah, of course. Great. So before going through all the, the questions in the chat, if there's anybody who has a verbal question first. Okay. Dr. Tim, this is Dr. Yes. Tim, this is Dr. Nirmal Kumar Dutta from Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, Entomology Division. So uh, if you allow, I have some comments, a few comments on this topic. Great. Dr. Tim? Yes, please. Okay, uh, actually I must thank from uh, Dr. Paul Jepson for his very nice and interesting presentation. Actually, you know that at Bangladesh Agriculture Research Institute, a group of entomologists are working uh, to, for developing a uh, integrated pest management package uh, against this fall hormone. From the introduction of this pest in our country, uh, body yeah. entomologists are trying to develop a package. And I agree that, that what uh, Paul Jepson has men mentioned in his speech that the, it is very important to find out the low risk and less toxic products in Bangladesh. And we have uh, are also doing research on this aspect to finding out the uh, good ones, good pesticides. And what is my experience about Dr. Paul Jepson has mentioned that the azadidactin based pesticides may be a good option. But what is our experience in Bangladesh that azadidactin based products are not doing well against Falarmiwam and other leptopyramid okay. pests in Bangladesh. Also, right. Bacillus thuringiensis. Actually, we have tested against so many borer pests, also against Falarmiwam, and Bt is also not uh, doing well in, uh, at the field level. And what is yes. another thing that, that you know that Dr. Alam has mentioned that chlorpyrifos and lambda silithrin are silithrin. These type of products are actually used by our farmers. In Bangladesh, Farmers are also in many places also amamectin benzoate. Amamectin benzoate, you know that in Bangladesh, yes. more than 100 brands are of amamectin benzoate in Bangladesh. It's a wild wow. insecticide in Bangladesh, but many uh, actually in some areas, I also asked the farmers, what about the amamectin benzoate? They are also telling that amamectin benzoate are, is also not working well in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh condition. Although in some of our previous research, we found that that certain brands of amamectin benzoate are working well, well, but at the field level, the recent scenario is that amamectin benzoate is not working well. Oh. Such, so in its way, this your presentation is valuable. I think that Bangladesh research yeah. will get scope uh, to yeah. uh, further their research in this area. And one yeah. thing is that we, at Bari, we are also emphasizing the use of biocontrol agents. You know yeah, that yeah. to 
biocontrolizes trichogamma kylonis and bracon habitor and we are mastering in bangladesh and we are getting right. good results recently yeah. we have identified telenomus remus you know that is an important yes, yes. parasite yeah. yeah yeah now right. we, we are trying to master telenomus remus in many south asian countries you know sri lanka and india are mastering this telenomus remus but in bangladesh right. we are still yeah. we cannot master telenomus remus and uh, we are trying right. hopeful we will be do it in future yeah so uh, we actually i agree that that uh, we should select some low risk and less toxic product uh, yeah. fitted in an oil design ipm program so thank yeah. you now they're really good thank you i mean, i think one thing we found in africa which may not compare well to your circumstances of course and farmers experiences as well is that late treatments to large larvae with many products including bt and um uh neem are just not very effective at all and so it's it's not a huge surprise those materials have a patchy record um they really only effective when used early so i mean it's a case of exploring the toolbox but also looking at application practices um how the product is applied and that that does make a difference and so kind of there's an optimization problem here it's not just the product it's the the crop and the the growth stage of the pest as well uh, to be considered but so no very interesting and it sounds like you're doing all the right things and i appreciate hearing about this very much great are there additional questions that anyone would like to pose verbally There are a range of questions in the chat as well. But if anyone wants to jump and ask a direct question, please do. Yeah, Tim, I may have some uh, questions and some swap conditions. Uh, I must say. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Paul, uh, this is very nice presentation, and uh, it, it will be helpful for us. Uh, we are, when we are working, we are actually considered the USAID part swap. And the swap part, uh, say for action use of pesticide, there are some conditions. So before we use a pesticide, we need to actually build the capacity for the technical assistance for the trainers and use some uh, educational materials handling of pesticide. The second one was the safer pesticide use to ensure the uh, personal protection equipment, transportation, storage conditions. And uh, also the long-term program, I mean, we actually collaborated and coordinate among the research institute and extension institute uh, and awareness building with the farmers too. And one area we need to uh, focus on, that is the main area, the local, uh, issues like as the quality standard of pesti pesticide. There are several pesticides in the market available, the multinational, national, and local one. So how do we actually choose uh, by the farmers? It is very difficult for them uh, to choose it. So that is the one of the area how we can focus on it. And other hand, we are actually emphasizing the bio product biocontrol but that is not yeah. much popularized by the farmers so yeah. these areas how we can negotiate with the farmers to build their capacity to give those yeah, yeah. thank you uh, yeah uh, common uh, stories apa ami meeting e ase zoom meeting e ekta ase i'm just looking through the list in the chat tim yeah. Yeah, I got to like that. Can you still hear me? We can still hear you. Yeah. Um, so carry on, yes. Well, just summarizing the chat, um, there are questions that came um, about host plant resistance, which I, I guess I could take very briefly, which is uh, we'll have a call in four days on April 4th that you'll all be invited to with 
Dr. Prasanna Budapali from CIMIT, is the director of CIMIT's Global Maze Program. And he will be addressing host plant resistance for fall armyworm and work that's being done uh, on, on that topic, primarily in Africa, but there is some work that has started in India as well. So stay tuned for answers to that question next week. Yeah. Um, there's additional questions um, with respect to economic threshold approaches um, to management of pesticide use. Question, what is the economic threshold for fall armyworm? Right. Um, um, more discussion about use of neem. Um, some more questions on biocontrol. Those are some of our main main things. Yeah. Uh, right. If you want to say a few words, and then if anyone else has additional questions, that would be great. Then otherwise, we could also move to close. Paul. Yeah. Um, well, look, I've loved talking to you all. I mean, it sounds like you've got a very dynamic environment there and a lot of conversation and communication happening, which is really critical. I emphasize the need, as you all know, of course, to talk directly with farmers about common sense and affordable approaches that are compatible and practices that are compatible with other IPM approaches. Even partial resistance, for example, is a great thing because you can extend the, the, the life cycle of the fall armyworm gets slightly extended. There's more opportunities for parasitoids to parasitize the larvae. And so you see these interactions happening between practices that are very subtle and difficult to measure, but actually make a difference in the field. So all of these factors play in and avoiding use of the broader spectrum materials, particularly pyrethroids that are very damaging to natural enemy populations and organophosphates that are toxic to people and not very effective against this pest. Some of those are some of the very important steps to take. Um, and uh, with regard to... Um, uh, yes, there's a lot more to say and do about neem, its quality, its concentrations, quality in the marketplace of all pesticides is an issue. It's an issue here. It's an issue all around the world. And I think in your marketplace, there are problems that you have to overcome and address by focusing on what the reliable marketing pathways are. Um, but overall, I hope what I've said today has been effective. I think if uh, if you look at the our articles we wrote on the farmers' needs in Malawi and Kenya, uh, there's some methods in there that social scientists use that you might have an interest in trying um, to kind of voice your approach in terms of the needs that farmers have expressed to you. And I know of people feel this is done, but when I see an anthropologist in action doing this effectively and really listening, it makes a big difference in how a program will go. And then our pesticides in um, our pesticides, our papers on pesticide risks basically give you a lot of science in a compressed form. So if you work in a regulatory agency in an extension office or you're a researcher wanting to look at pesticide impacts or trade off risks and benefits, uh, please uh, look at that work and make use of it. And um, then you've got a scientific basis for discriminating between different materials. But I really appreciate talking to you today and uh, really enjoyed it. And I think great to see Tim again. And uh, an honor to meet uh, some of your senior colleagues there and hear about work in Bangladesh. And I thank very, everybody for listening. Thanks very much, Paul. And I think with that, we can, we can shift to closing. Um, again, you will all receive an invitation and reminders for a seminar coming on April 4th on host plant resistance and fall armyworm. And we will also send you a copy of Paul's PowerPoint presentation so you can refer to it and also share with you copies of, um, of some of the papers that, that Paul has referred to in, in this talk. Uh, before closing, I'd like to kindly request it Dr. Hussein, if you'd like to say a, a last few words before we finish the meeting. Uh, yeah, thank you, team. Actually, it is a, a timely organized uh, meeting, I can say, in Bangladesh. Uh, again, I can uh, repeat that 
maize is very, very promising crop now in Bangladesh. So we want to protect these crops. So it is a food security crop, I can say. Um, a lot of uh, progress depend on um, the maize crop now. So as I learned from uh, Professor Paul Zefshan's clearly presentations um, <clears throat> about um, details, uh, uh, pesticide use, health use, risks, um, uh, all other things uh, he correctly mentioned from his experience, especially in African experience he shared uh, with us. Of course, uh, it is important for uh, Bangladesh. So uh, can it be possible uh, next time visit Paul to Bangladesh? Of oh, course. To organize in the yeah. uh, um, getaway some other our uh, extensions uh, department is here. Uh, yeah. the research are, so we can uh, increase yeah. uh, from this side. Um, yeah. So of course that would be yes, great. So of course, I yeah. am not the right man uh, to uh, discuss these things, but no, no. Uh, I am enriched uh, this uh, yeah. uh, from this uh, presentation. Yeah, I mean, no, it would be it would be a great pleasure, of course, and I'm glad also to participate in discussions and Zoom, you know, makes it possible in ways that uh, yeah. you know uh, we can continue talking. But yes, of course, yeah. I'd love to once the travel opens up again. Yes. So um, I can think that we are in this, our participant also um, uh, in this, their knowledge. Uh, so um, uh, from my side, Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Research Institute is always uh, positive, um, uh, such kind of uh, knowledgeable um, uh, uh, things to receive. So uh, I can uh, say um, uh, thank you uh, for your time you. um, yeah. uh, and uh, Simit colleagues, uh, those are working on it. Also, those are um, connected in uh, Zoom platform. Uh, so we hope to see you again uh, here in Bangladesh. Yeah, and you. of course, um, uh, we are uh, taking all measures, um, threats uh, on um, maize productions and yeah. coming days in Bangladesh. So well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Best, best of luck in your endeavors and thank you again and great to okay. see everybody. And um, I hope that's been useful. Thank you. Thank you. So Thanks, team, everybody. and we'll see you on the on the fourth, I hope. Yes, Dr. Bessie. Okay. okay, you can close <laughs> from your side. Okay. That sounds good. Well, I guess it, uh, basically thank you everybody for for joining. And again, April 4th, we'll talk about those plants resistance. So April 4th, Deca Hobbing. Okay, ton of butter. Bye. Bye. Bye to everybody.